few days ago, I saw a headline that got me thinking. It said, this is the perfect time to focus on self-improvement. I didn't bother reading it, but I did remember thinking that probably was a good idea. A few days later, I decided to go looking for it on Google again and uh, searched in what to do uh, during the self-isolation period. And I found that there are a whole lot of articles and ideas out there about what we could be using our time for during this social distancing or practicing. A Los Angeles Times article was titled, What to Do in the Coronavirus Quarantine. How about nothing? Another on Forge said, now is not the time to obsess over productivity. The New York Times, they had an article titled, What to Watch, Listen to, and Read During the Coronavirus Quarantine. The one I decided to actually read was found on Live Science, and it was titled Q&A, an expat quarantined in China, shares how to survive eight weeks of isolation. I figured if anybody would have good advice to share on how to occupy yourself during a period of self-isolation, it would be somebody who's already been through it and for eight weeks. And actually, uh, the advice that she shared, I was not disappointed by. Her name was Karen Orteza, and she shared a list of tips. She said, keep to a schedule, eat well, get enough sleep, and try to sleep during your regular time. Exercise, use the time to try to do something new that you haven't done before. Maybe learn a new language or take up a new instrument. Do something for someone else. Send drawings or letters to a nursing home. Make items for homeless shelters. Call or write family members to check up on them. Connect with somebody each day, even if it is only to smile at them from across the street. Don't spend a lot of time on social media or watching the news. Get outside if you can. Stay positive, look at the big picture, and find the silver lining. Some positive and healthy ideas there. Uh, in our sermon today, I'm going to talk about something that we can do, something that maybe would fall into the category of new for many of us, during this extra alone time that we have. And it's something I don't think I have talked about before. It is, wait for it, meditation. Yes, meditation. Right now, you're probably thinking I've had too much self-isolation time already. Uh, maybe you think that um, that's a little bit of a strange suggestion. Meditation. That's probably because meditation, biblically, is something very different from what you are probably thinking of when you hear that term. See, when most of us hear the word meditation, we think of lighting some incense, emptying the mind, holding a slightly uncomfortable position for long hours where you go mm, in a deep voice. But biblically, biblically, meditation is none of those things. Meditation is not emptying the mind. Meditation is not holding a slightly uncomfortable position and saying, oom. Uh, I guess you could light a candle and incense if you like the smell, but it really has nothing to do with meditation. Uh, meditation is actually simply memorizing something and then spending time thinking about it. You might recite what you have memorized or think on ways to apply what you've memorized or seek to better understand what it is that you have memorized by turning it over in your head and thinking on it. Here's an easy to remember definition. Meditation is spending time thinking about something you have memorized. Meditation is spending time thinking about something that you have memorized. The chapter in the Bible which has the most to say about meditation is Psalm 119. And it's also actually the longest chapter in the Bible. Now, don't worry, we're not going to try to memorize all of Psalm 119 and meditate on it today. We're just going to look at a few of the opening verses uh, to see why meditating on God's word is a healthy practice 
and something when we have extra time, uh, it would be a good thing to focus on a little bit. So we're going to be in Psalm 119, and we're just going to look at the first 16 verses this morning. There are actually 176 of them. Um, You would be able to read those on your own time. We have the time for it. Well, let's open with a word of prayer and then see what God's word says to us this morning. Dear God, uh, thank you for uh, this, this time that we live in where we are able to, even though we can't come together and see and spend time with one another physically, we are able to um, see and hear your word shared online. We're able to be in the comfort and safety of our own homes, um, reading your word along, studying. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the importance of memorizing your word and meditating on it so that we can live godlier lives, be more pleasing in all we think and do in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So there are 176 verses in this psalm. So 16 is just a small bit, but plenty for one message. You might have already noticed that the psalm is blocked off into chunks of eight verses. And depending on um, your Bible, you might see a subtitle listed above each of those eight verses. In mine, it has Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, He, Wal, and so on. Psalm 119 is a unique psalm because it runs through all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it has eight verses where the first word, the first letter of the first word, starts with the corresponding letter of the alphabet. So the first eight verses all start with the Hebrew Aleph. And then the next eight verses all start with the Hebrew Baith. The subject of the poem can be seen uh, even in these first two sections. You don't have to read the whole thing to to get the major point that's being talked about here. It's all about the Bible. It's thinking about the Bible, obeying the Bible, meditating on the Bible, blessing the Bible. You see different... um, Words for talking about the Bible, uh, rules, testimonies, laws, precepts, statutes, commandments, all shared in these first 16 verses. Most of those are rules words, but testimonies has to do with histories um, and stories. So it's not just the rules part of the Bible, but all of the Bible, including its stories. And meditation Even though the word only appears once in these 16 verses, meditation is all throughout these verses. Uh, The message of the psalmist in the verses we've read is that we should memorize and think on God's word so we can obey it. 
that is uh, essentially what meditation is. You have it memorized and you turn it over repeatedly in your mind, seeking to understand it well and apply it well. Here are some of the things the psalmist says are advantages to meditating on God's word. One, meditating on God's word helps us to be blessed by God. That's verses one and two. It helps people to walk in God's will, God's expectation for our lives. It helps us to seek the Lord with our heart uh, and to keep or store up his testimonies. Basically, meditating on God's word helps us to obey God more frequently. And thus, by obeying God more, it helps us to receive more of God's blessing in our lives. You know, it's hard to do anything if you are not intentional about it. Jenny and I have learned that the laundry does not get done unless somebody intentionally goes and does the laundry. Wouldn't it be nice if the laundry could get done without being intentional about it? We wish it could get done accidentally. We wish the dishes would get done accidentally. We wish that dinner would make itself accidentally. But it just doesn't work that way. It's hard to do anything if you aren't intentional about it. You have to think about doing it, and then you have to go and do it. Meditating on God's word helps us to be intentional about walking in it. Um, It adds it as a thing we are thinking about through our day, a thing we keep in mind, a thing we desire, a thing that we are on the alert, watching out for opportunities to put into practice when we meditate on God's word. When we don't think about it, when we don't have it memorized, um, it's much, much more difficult to be intentional in walking in it. And so we can miss out on many blessings because of that. You know, God's word says that we are supposed to love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. But it's hard to do either of those accidentally, isn't it? Um, Sometimes it can be a little hard to do even when you're uh, being intentional about it. But if you want to just accidentally love God and your neighbors, well, good luck. To love God and to love others, you really need to be mindful of, of the fact that you are supposed to love God and love others. And you need to be intentional about it. Think of ways that you can um, show love to God. Think of ways that you can show love to others. And during this time, with this coronavirus going around, we maybe have less time to spend directly interacting with other people, but that doesn't mean that we're out of opportunities to show love to other people or to show love to God. We can still send encouraging messages, still give encouraging phone calls, still reach out and help those who maybe it's more dangerous for them to go out into society at this time. There are ways to show love to God and others, but we need to be intentional about it. And we need to be thinking, meditating on God's word to help us be intentional about it. And as we do, as we meditate on God's word and walk in it, we're blessed by God. Another benefit of meditation is that it helps us to praise God with an upright heart. That's mentioned in verse 7. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. One, again, it helps this way because it helps us to be intentional about it. It's hard to praise God on accident. But if you're meditating on his word, thinking about him, intentionality increases. Two, It helps to give us reasons to praise God and a springboard to jump out from. Um, Say you're meditating on Psalm 23, for example. You've uh, read through it. You are thinking about it. You are thinking about uh, the, the words which say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you are turning that over in your mind through your day. Thinking about all the ways that uh, God is a shepherd to you, that he supplies care for you, that he protects you, that he leads you. Pretty soon, you will find yourself uh, praising God because of how good he is to you as your shepherd. 
uh, meditating on his righteous and good rules, med- meditating on his word, helps spring forth in our hearts praise to him and upright praise. Uh, it also says learning God's righteous rules helps us to praise him with an upright heart because we know his rules and we walk in them intentionally we are able to praise him from a position of being in fellowship with him we're clean upright people enjoying and praising a perfectly holy and upright god that's a good thing a good feeling It also makes praise more genuine when it comes from an upright heart. Just think about it. Does the phrase, I love you, God, because you are merciful, does that sound more authentic coming from an upright, merciful heart or from a heart that is filled with anger and filled with wrath? It is more authentic, more beautiful to praise God from an upright heart, to say as a merciful one, I love you, God, because you are are more merciful than any I know. Meditating on God's word in more ways than one helps us to praise God with an upright heart. Verses 9 to 11. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verses 9 to 11 and especially verse 11 show that meditating on God's word helps to protect us from sin. A person's way is kept pure by guarding it according to God's word. Um, The way that you are going, you hedge it in, protect it, keep it safe from sin, keep sin outside of it through Knowledge of God's word, directing us into what is right and what is wrong. Meditating on God's word helps us to sin less. Um, That is why the psalmist made it a diligent habit and practice of his to take in God's word, to store it, memorize it in his heart, so that he would not sin against God. Consider our Lord Jesus Christ's example in his victory over temptation. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, after he had been baptized, he was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness where he spent 40 days fasting. And then at the end of those 40 days fasting, he was tempted by the devil. The temptations came when Jesus was at a physical point of weakness and hunger. The first temptation that was leveled at him was targeting this physical weakness and this hunger. Came to him by the adversary, the devil. And the devil approached him and uh, told him to turn some rocks into bread. The devil said in Matthew 4, verse 3, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. It's the first temptation Jesus faced. But Jesus answered him, verse 4, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And from there, the adversary uh, took Jesus and issued toward him several more temptations. And in response to every single one of those temptations, Jesus recited scripture to the adversary. Uh, He guarded his way with God's word. He hid God's word in his heart so that he might not sin against God. Every temptation, every temptation that Jesus faced during that grueling period, he responded with something from God's word that he had memorized and obviously been meditating on. He knew well the meaning of the word. He knew well the application of it. Uh, He had been thinking, accumulating it in his mind, Uh, meditating on its meaning, uh, focusing on doing it. In doing so, in showing us this, Jesus showed us that indeed man doesn't just live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He lived it. He showed that he lived and walked in accordance with the words coming from the mouth of God, and it protected him 
from making serious mistakes into temptation. And he showed us that hiding God's word in our hearts helps us to not sin against God. Jesus showed us that Psalm 119 verse 11 is true, and that Psalm 119 verse 9 is true, and verse 10, it's true. He showed us. We hide God's word in our heart. We meditate on it. It helps us to sin less. Now, one of the nice things about these days of isolation is that the number one excuse against meditating on Scripture doesn't apply as well right now. The main excuse is, I am too busy to devote my time to the hard work of memorizing and meditating on God's Word. I have work to do, I have places to go, I have things to think about, and, and, and on. Now, I don't know about everyone's unique situation. Maybe you actually have gotten busier as a result of um, these quarantine rules that have gone out. My wife and I are not looking forward to the fact that uh, when this picks up, she is likely going to have to work a lot more than she has been. Right now, she works two days a week, 12-hour shifts. Sometimes she'll have to work uh, a full-time shift. But if this picks up, she might have to find herself working overtime at a hospital. So, sure, some people might become more busy because of what's been going on. But for most of us, um, we have more free time now than we did. So the excuse of, I don't have time to memorize God's word, is, is not, it's never a very good one. But now it's particularly not a good one. We could spend all this extra time that we have uh, following the advice of the New York Times and reading lots of books and watching lots of movies and listening to all kinds of stuff. We could be browsing the internet getting on so social media, uh, trying to maximize productivity, tackling the to-do list, working on home improvement projects. Oh, I'm not saying that um, we should avoid um, recreation and that we need to always be productive. None of, none, of, none of those things are bad. It's good to rest, it's good to be productive, but with all the extra free time that we are finding ourselves with, Let's not look at meditation, which has such value for helping us to be blessed, for helping us to praise God from a pure heart, for helping us to walk in obedience and to sin less, and many more things if we were to tackle all 176 verses this morning. Let's not look at meditation and say, I'm too busy to do that. All right, so let me give you some suggestions on how to do it and some, some sections of the Bible that might be particularly good for you to spend time meditating on. So here is one way, a good way, to go about memorizing um, sections of the Bible. It's to choose a chapter of the Bible you'd like to learn and aim to memorize one verse a day. So on day one, you would memorize verse one. Then on day two, you memorize verse two and review verse one. On day three, you memorize verse three and review verse two and review verse one. And on you go until you've got the full chapter covered. When you've uh, memorized, reached the last day of the full chapter, you then spend a few extra weeks, depending on how long that chapter is, reciting it to yourself once a day. And then soon enough, you will have it in here very solidly and can recall it whenever you would like in its entirety from beginning to end, middle, here, there, everywhere, and have it very solidly in your mind, ready to go, ready to help you in life. And then having it in your mind well, spend time thinking about it. Uh, you know, just reciting words without thought uh, doesn't produce anything of value. You want to think about what it is that you are memorizing and think about how it works in your life, how to apply it, how to obey God in this matter. Uh, following that method, I know that my wife has memorized several small books of the Bible. 
Uh, she's gotten Colossians memorized. I believe she's gotten Ephesians and First Peter memorized too. Not 100% on Ephesians. Uh, but you can, within maybe less than a year, even memorize an entire small book of the Bible following that method. Now, for some of us, memory might be harder than it is for others. For some, it might be easier. Maybe you can do two verses a day. Maybe you might have to spend several days on one verse. Uh, but we start where we're able and work from there. All right, so now some suggestions for chapters to look at. If you're looking for something really practical, uh, check out Romans 12. It's dense with applications, uh, dense with um, commandments for how we are to live the Christian life. Also check out Matthew 5, and you could do Matthew 5, 6, and 7 if you're really ambitious. Uh, Matthew 5 is the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the part that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Great verses. If you want a good chapter for learning the gospel, then check out Ephesians 2 or check out Romans 5. Uh, if you memorize both of those, you'll have within a chapter a good grasp on the gospel message. If you want a chapter that will promote good, healthy, positive thinking, if you were the sort to find yourself um, thinking negatively or, or with lots of anxiety from time to time, or you tend to look at the glass as half empty, then you might want to check out Philippians 4. Philippians 4 is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Uh, encourages us to think on things that are lovely and pure and commendable. And anything that uh, we might be anxious about, we should uh, submit it to God in prayer with thanksgiving. Great chapter. If you want something peaceful and encouraging, then you can't go wrong with Psalm 23. Maybe many of you have already memorized that one. If you want some good worship and praise material, Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 both have really worshipful sections within them. Here's a good one, a really good starting one, especially a good time for it. Why not... Uh, Look at Psalm 131. That is the psalm that we covered on Wednesday together and is one that can really encourage us during this time of uncertainty to place our hope in God rather than try to occupy ourselves with things that are simply too great and too big for us to be able to solve on our own. Uh, psalm 131, it will help you to hope in the Lord during these uncertain times. And it's only three verses. It's a nice, easy place for you to start. You can memorize them within a few short days, maybe even one day if you're a good memorizer, and then spend time meditating on it, thinking about the need to hope in the Lord, reasons to hope in the Lord, the beauty of hoping in the Lord, um, casting those things that burden you upon the Lord and hoping in Him instead and finding yourself and your soul resting in a calm, quiet place. The Bible's a big book. As you check it out, read it, God will direct you to things that he wants you to be meditating on. Um, and I would encourage you, if meditation has not been a practice in your Christian life so far, give it a try. We have the time, and it will be beneficial to you not just now, but in the days when the coronavirus is long past and we're back to work. You will still have at your fingertips words of God, able to turn them around in your mind to walk in better obedience and blessedness. Well, let's close in prayer, asking for God's blessing on the rest of our day and his help enabling our mind to memorize and meditate on his word well. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, we ask that you would help our minds to take in your word and think on it accurately, to grow in love and desire for obeying your word and walking in your word in fellowship with you. God, we have such a rich gift. You have written out for us a book filled with wisdom that will help us 
to have a profitable life, to have a safer life, to have a more rich and joy-filled life. Help us, Lord, not to neglect it, not to read it flippantly, but to take it and read it and learn it and think hard on it and think long on it so that we can live it. God, um, with this extra time that we are finding ourselves with in the days ahead, I pray you help us to find um, ways we haven't thought of before that we can be obeying you, Uh, ways that we can show love from a distance, ways that we can um, engage with your word and, and, and learn it more so that we can, in days to come, from here and forward, be able to walk in greater obedience. Lord, uh, this is a hard time, but good can come of us having this extra, extra time. I pray, Lord, we use it well in one of those ways to be meditating on your word. God, I pray, pray for your um, blessing and protection upon your people as they are home um, in these days. I pray, Lord, you would um, watch over Bourbon and Etna Green and Bremen and Plymouth and um, all the the different areas that people are are residing in around and going to this church. And Lord, I pray you protect and help us all. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your kindness, your grace, and your mercy to us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.